Just want to say we're going to start in two minutes. I have the agenda on the screen so that the presenters know which sequence they appear in so you can be ready to run to the podium when it's your turn. Mic's on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's make a start. Um, so this is the lightning talk session. Um, we've been a little bit optimistic. We've got 10 presentations to fit into 90 minutes. Um, some of them are slightly shorter than 10 minutes, so we hope we can actually do it. So that's why we're starting on time. Um, as I said just earlier, if the presenters can note where you are in the sequence, um, then you can be ready at the foot of the steps um, for your turn when the um, previous presenter has finished. So it's 10 minutes, including getting up here, doing your talk, any Q&A, and going back. If you finish early, you don't need to hang around for five minutes, whatever it is, just to use up your time. Um, we can use it for somebody else. So I just want to start proceedings off uh, with Neil Robinson. Hey folks, um, Neil Robinson, ADVA Optical Networking. Um, so we're going to do a quick talk about a fairly big subject um, in the optical space. I realize this is like, at the bottom of the stack right, compared to a lot of the talks that go on at Apricot, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, my focus is typically on data center interconnect. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening in the data center interconnect space um, in optical networking. So. Let's go. Okay, so um, this is a lightning talk, so I'm not going to go through a whole lot of the optical theory. I'm just putting up here the sort of two choices that you have in data center interconnect. Uh, so on the left-hand side, coherent transmission, I'd say that's typically dominated DCI for the last probably almost 10 years now. Um, and on the right is the alternative, which is the way optics used to be for years and years and years before that, right? what we call direct detect um, 
communications. You can kind of think of it as, as sort of like coherent is like an FM radio and direct detect is like an AM radio, right? So different quality levels, different capabilities, but also different um, costs and powers. So coherent, I try to sort of pull out some of the properties here, right? So maximum spectral efficiency, what's that mean? That means you can stick the most capacity on a fiber using coherent communications. Um, direct detect simply can't keep up, right? But that comes at a cost, right? So the, uh, the optics um, and the electronics are much, much more expensive when it comes to coherent communications. Draws more power, takes more space. Um, so those are all sort of in favor of the direct detect optics. Yeah? If you don't need all that capacity, you can get a cheaper, lower power, lower cost, smaller space alternative. Um, Typically, coherent was used in what we call regional, so a few hundreds of kilometers to long distance, yeah, thousands of kilometers distance, um, and direct detect is much more your metro or campus type applications. Um, but as I said before, in that DCI space where you're talking about you know, connecting data centers that are only maybe 80 kilometers, 50 miles apart, um, coherent really started to play a role. So that's kind of the, the sort of two choices that you've had. Um, now why, you know, why has Coherent really sort of you know, kicked direct detect to the side for the past 10 years or so? Um, it's flexibility too, right? So this is a, uh, I don't go through the chart too much, but on the horizontal axis is sort of how many bits you can put on a single wavelength, a single carrier. And on the vertical axis are all the different ways that you can play with how much space you're taking on the optical fiber from a, uh, from a frequency point of view, right? So you want to stack more and more wavelengths together, so how much space are those wavelengths taking? Um, you can see you have a huge range of options with Coherent, right? This is a single transceiver and you can program it uh, depending upon what your capacity and reach uh, requirements are. With Direct Detect, if I, I mean, you have one option, right? It's pretty limited um, in what it can do. Um, so, you know, one of, the, one of the value adds of Coherent is its flexibility. Um, looking at power consumption, right? So this is uh, this is um, quite important for a lot of a lot of companies here that are building out, you know, large data centers. Um, this is where Direct Detect looks a whole lot better, right? So um, the graph here is showing the the bit rate, right? So let's I, I kind of pulled out here at 100 gig for Direct Detect and about 200 gig for Coherent, and then this is the power consumption in watts, right? So Coherent is vastly higher. Um, in power consumption compared to a direct detect solution, right? So just to look at a couple of those attributes that I put on that first slide and how they compare. Um, so why direct detect hasn't done so well? Uh, typically, um, customers in the DCI space have small teams. They need um, sort of very simple plug and play capabilities, right? And so that's why direct detect struggled, right? You need to have somebody typically that has some optical engineering capabilities on your team, right? And that doesn't scale so well. So, um, but recently we've seen like a plug like this. This is a QSFP28 plug um, that's perfectly capable of going into a data center switch, right? Doesn't matter whether it's, a, you know, it could be a, a Vista, Juniper, Cisco, whatever. Um, data center switch into the QSFP28 spot spits out a DWDM wavelength, right? It's four and a half watts power dissipation. Um, but it's got a very small dispersion tolerance, right? So dispersion is a characteristic of the optical fiber. And so I mean, the critical number on this slide is this, this one right here, right? So it's, if you're doing an 80 kilometer link, you've got to correct the dispersion on that link to within plus or minus five kilometers, which traditionally has been sort of a field engineer with a bag full of dispersion compensation modules. Try this one, try that one, figure out which one works. So how do we make this a little bit more coherent like in terms of its plug and play capability? So that's where you know, we start to see solutions like this, and Adver's not the only provider, but this is what we've been looking at now for um, really bringing these direct detect solutions into play against the coherent type solution, right? So we've got a, what we call a smart optical layer. So it's got a built-in dispersion compensator, built-in power compensation. Um, it really just makes it very easy to deploy those direct detect plugs, right? The amplifiers, and this whole box just takes care of everything you need to do um, from an optical perspective, right? So you don't need those trained optical engineers now to sort of roll this out in mass production. Is it real? Sure. Um, it's a demo we did um, last year, actually, around this time last year. So what I've got hooked up here is, um, this is a, a Vista 7500 um, spine switch full of those QSFP28s. 
uh, goes off into the amplifier, comes back out of the amplifier, goes back to the Arista switch. This is showing you all the wavelengths on the fiber. Um, this is the signal to noise ratio. And basically, we had four terabits of transmission um, in, uh, in, in essentially the lowest power dissipation possible, right? So you don't even need a, a DWDM transceiver, separate transceiver for this, right? Those optics go right into the, uh, the switch at the data center. So, trying to go this as quick as I can. Does Direct Detect have a future in this space? I think so, yes. Um, as I put there, some caveats apply, right? So, uh, you can't get as much capacity on a fiber as you would with coherent, right? So, four terabits is this, this is this example here. So, 40 wavelengths, each at 100 gig. Um, coherent would be something equivalent would be like 25 terabits, right? So, coherent gives you that much, much more capacity, but much more power, much more cost, right? Um, so uh, I don't think you'll see a coherent power equivalent solution until probably 2020, maybe, um, looking at the technology there. Um, and I think it's, you know, where we see this and where typically where we see customers deploying, this is kind of homogeneous networks where you want a cookie cutter type approach, right? So it's, you don't want to be doing specific bespoke engineering. Um, this is meant for mass production, mass rollout, right? So um, that's really where we try to push this solution. So I'm not gonna leave, I'm not gonna read the summary to you. I, I don't know how many minutes I have left, I have no idea. But I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. No questions? Oh well. Thank you very much, okay. Neil. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> next up we have Suman. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Shuman. I am from uh, Amarati Limited. Uh, this is one of the leading ISP from Bangladesh. So uh, I want to uh, actually, actually uh, want to show you one uh, case study uh, that is on uh, DNS firewall that is uh, based on response policy zone. So uh, uh, actually, uh, this is uh, our one pilot project. Uh, we uh, did it on. Uh, uh, tested it uh, with uh, with a segment of our client, and uh, I uh, will show you how actually we did that and how it was effective for our customer. How it was effective to build a safer internet for our customer also. So, uh, what was our, uh, our motivation? Uh, our motivation was. Uh, we are planning to implement a, a common security service platform uh, for our customers in an easiest and cost effective way. Uh, and uh, another thing we have in mind that we definitely will not deploy any device in our customer end so that it can incur cost and time for us and definitely we will not provide any effort for every customer to implement this service. So, and uh, another thing was uh, we are planning to provide a service for our customer so that uh, we can feel a bit, a bit safer in the internet. And uh, after the brainstorming, uh, we uh, got uh, a uh, idea then we can implement DNS response policy zone and uh, we can provide this uh, service only to implement a caching DNS server in our at uh, service provider end. So uh, that was our motivation to implement the service. And uh, I just uh, want uh, to show you one or two slides of uh, just basics. Uh, 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 we have already seen a very good presentation from IAC on response policy zone. So I will not go in detail on that. Uh, our response policy zone, actually, uh, we can provide a overlay custom uh, information to the uh, global uh, DNS query. So uh, system, administration, uh, system administrator can provide his uh, input through the response policy zone to the DNS resolution. Uh, 
RPG data is supplied uh, as a DNS zones. Uh, till now, we can provide uh, DF bind can uh, support 32 response policy zone uh, in his uh, response po policy uh, uh, zone data. And uh, it actually, it can be work uh, as a far along cloud because we are not implementing anything for at, at customer end. We are just deploying a caching DNS server at our uh, data center. And uh, obviously it has a limitation uh, if any uh, uh, thread uh, is connecting without any DNS resolution, if it's connect with directly with IP, then we have no control on that with this response policy zone. Uh, so of what request we can block using the response policy zone, we can definitely uh, block some phishing domain uh, that comes from email on, or any other sources. Uh, we can block uh, malware sites. We can block ransomware. I can remember how in the WannaCry, uh, 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 if uh, WannaCry was infected through our network, there was a kill switch domain. So if we block that domains, so it, it is possible to uh, block this uh, random or also this type of uh, uh, this type of threads. So obviously we can block botnet command and control sites, which is in in RPG zone. And most importantly, we can find some compromised hosts from the DNS query log. So uh, that is uh, uh, we got the we, uh, unique feature. We can find which hosts are actually compromised in our no network so that we, if we can find those compromised hosts and if we can uh, segregate those hosts from our network, so I think it, it can be, uh, it can help to uh, infected others, it can help to protect others from those infected hosts. Uh, for DNS RPG, we can uh, we can take feed from uh, different source, uh, and uh, from it can uh, we can take feed from the uh, master slave uh, uh, DNS uh, zone transfer. We can uh, we used IXAFER or AXAFER uh, uh, for for this case. And uh, in our implementation, we use bind. Obviously, it can uh, implement with the pod DNS and other DNS application also. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as I can remember, it is uh, supported from uh, BIND 9.8. We have used actually uh, BIND 9.11.2. And uh, it is recommended to use from uh, source other than RPM or, uh, uh, or dev. So we have used uh, the source file and compiled with uh, RPG uh, support. And uh, uh, in our implementation, uh, we, we first implemented in login mode. We have not blocked in fast week anything. We have just checked how it is worked. How uh, is it generating any false positive for this case? What we can do for these false positives? And uh, uh, d definitely we have restricted the zone, uh, we have restricted the name server from uh, uh, others. Uh, customer did so that it can not be a open resolver at all. And uh, uh, in our implementation, we have uh, restricted from the router that the client, uh, so that the uh, customers can't do, use other name servers from uh, their network. So, and uh, login, uh, we uh, implemented, uh, as we are rewriting DNS result, uh, uh, DNS query, so we can uh, we uh, you, we used to log in from there, and one interesting thing was what will happen for the DNS sec request because uh, if we uh, rewrite the uh, DNS query, so DNS sec uh, will not work in that case. So uh, there is an option to uh, global option uh, whether I want to break uh, DNS sec or not. So there uh, we used a break DNS sake, no. Uh, 
So uh, we, uh, we believe if, we, if any guy uses DNSSEC, he's a good guy, so we don't want to block them. Uh, and we have used uh, some uh, Joan for, uh, for, uh, to block TORS, to block uh, for Bogon filters, for botnet CC, for, uh, to block malware, to block um, adware, and, uh, and obviously there is a custom zone that is uh, RPG local. So if we have any uh, customer, if we need anything customized that we want to whitelist or anything, if there is any false positive happen, we can update those data in this uh, uh, RPG local file because the other zones are automatically uh, updated from the uh, RPG zone data feeder. So we, can, so we are using RPG local for our custom rules. So, uh, we, uh, so that, this was the uh, bind configuration. Okay, so I am not uh, going in details. So uh, I just summarize, I can just summarize the uh, RPG uh, uh, implementation. We have uh, implemented for 390, div, uh, 390 customers and uh, we got uh, uh, this number of hits. We, we uh, uh, analyzed this with uh, DNS tap. Obviously DNS uh, uh, tap, uh, DNS bind need to be recompiled to use DNS tap. And uh, we have blocked uh, about 55,000 domains, and we have uh, infected. We have got there was 32 infected customers in this uh, pilot project period. So that's all. Uh, that's my uh, concept. So if you have any question. Okay, I'm not sure using the glasses here or not. Uh, I am going to talk uh, about two uh, relatively recent uh, uh, RFCs uh, from IPv6. Uh, the first one is related to happy ables. Uh, I guess most of you already know about the document that was published in 2012, uh, which basically is trying to avoid the host waiting for IPv6 to fail because before fall, falling back to, to IPv4. Uh, that document basically what it's doing is stating an asynchronous way to query for both A records and quad A records and then sending uh, synchronously uh, the TCP to, to bot. Okay, so then it uses the, 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 the faster one. So this will be the graphic description of what Happy Ables version two is doing. Uh, again, it's a synchronous uh, querying bot uh, records. And then the problem is that if you get the response, for example, first for the Quate record, is wasting time until the response for the record is coming back, okay? So uh, it has some advantages, but it has seems this wasted time so, uh, some folk at Apple decided that maybe it's better to, instead of doing it synchronously, doing it asynchronously, and they have been doing trials during a couple of years or so, and once they have verified that their idea was working well, they have prepared the document, and, and that's what, what we have. So. Uh, the document is not something completely new, but it's something that has been already deployed in the field in millions of devices, right? So this will be the graphic representation of that. We uh, send at the same time asynchronously uh, the request for the A and the Quad A record, and then the first one that comes back starts the uh, TCP. So obviously we don't have the wasted time, okay? Now, what this is basically doing is uh, changing the default address selection for IPv6 depending on the response, okay? So that's, that's the basic, basic thing that it means for, 
for the applications that are using uh, a stack with support for happy balls too. Uh, now I have a consideration here is, uh, is happy balls good or bad? And yes, in principle, uh, in my opinion, it's good for users because they don't have this uh, wait time if the, the stack needs to fall back to IPv4 in case IPv6 is failing. But at the same time, uh, Happy Evolves is hiding some common failures in networks, uh, like, for example, when PAT M2 discovery is broken. Okay, so it has some advantages, clearly. But I, I was thinking, okay, we can improve it. We can try to make happy Ables better if it's able to report the failures back to the ISP so the ISP can trace those problems and try to solve them. So I started, well, I just said that. I started working in a document, which is uh, the first line in, in the screen. Um, and what I am trying to do is just making the happy Ables uh, implementation to report to the ISP that failures, okay? At the moment, the document is not winning attention from the B6 working group. Uh, I, I plan to submit a new version probably next week, uh, and I hope it's, it's winning some attention. I am not going because the time is short, so I am not going to explain how it works, you have the reference to the document, please read it and, and provide inputs. Um, so conclusions for this part of the presentation. Uh, happy Ables is good, but it's not solving one of the big problems that we have with IPv6 is uh, PAT M2 discovery failures. Uh, that's it for this part. And then I go to the second document, which is uh, unique IPv6 prefix per host. Uh, this is not really a new protocol. It's something that is widely supported because it's a set, not uh, anything new. You don't need to change the implementation. What it's actually doing is using existing IPv6 protocols to allow, instead of allocating a host or an interface, a single IPv6 address, so a slash 128, is allowing to locate the complete slash 64, okay? Uh, that means, for example, that you are able to isolate host in different slash 64, uh, and also it means that if you provide a single slash 64 to a unique interface or to uh, a single host, uh, basically you can have, for example, in that host as many virtual machines as you need and one single IPv6 address for each virtual machine. Some usage scenarios. Well, this is something that we have been doing already for a long time ago because it's the way that we allocate addresses uh, to each PDP context in server networks. So it's, it's not really new. The, the way we do it now for other networks is, is, is the new part. Um, but we can extend this concept to, for example, hotspots, uh, corporate networks, uh, data centers, um, and also it uh, allows, for example, to use IPv4 as a service into IPv6 only networks in enterprises, okay? So I am looking into uh, very interesting uh, functionalities for this protocol because I believe it, it will be possible to just run IPv6 in your enterprise network and then if any host needs uh, and, and providing isolation based on, on a single slash 64 to every host and then provide a way for an automatic VPN to offer IPv4 service uh, for those applications that still require the IPv4 service. So, well, briefly talking about the hotspot usage, basically is, uh, it provides the advantage of isolating the, the users. Uh, out, uh, avoiding automatic, uh, automatically security problems and so on, better scalability. Uh, for the data centers, it's about the same uh, scenario as for, for, or the same how to do it as for the hotspots. And the only thing here we need is that the, the, the server that is using this, uh, this mechanism is capable to, to internally allocate the different addresses to, to, the, to the different virtual machines, right? And then the first hop router must be able also to handle the responses and, and use them. Um, 
Uh, concluding, uh, I think it's uh, a stable and secure IPv6 only experience. What is uh, providing this, this protocol is something that, that is there already, nothing new to implement basically, no performance impact. It allows increasing the security uh, communication uh, or disallowing the communications depending on which point of view you, you see uh, among different devices uh, through the first hop and, and basically that's it. Too short, too, too fast maybe? Very that good. Okay. So you've got uh, still time for questions, any questions? I have a longer presentation of this, of a, a longer version of this presentation, but I was told that I have just 10 minutes, so yeah. maybe I, I run too much. No, it's fine. Okay, thanks very much, Thank you. Jordi. Next up, we have Art. Oh, where's the clicker? Oh, Where did the clicker go? Oh, yeah. What is that? Yeah, good. So, uh, what's, what we're going to talk about is actually happening right now. Let's begin with a short introduction. So first, what an amplification DDoS attack is? So in a nutshell, uh, most servers on the internet serve more uh, data to clients, uh, 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 serve data to clients, and they usually send more data to a client than they receive from them. This is okay for TCP-based servers as TCP a protocol has a built-in mechanism called triple-way handshake uh, for verifying the remote IP address of a client. However, there's no such mechanism present in UDP. Each author of a UDP-based protocol must design uh, their own handshake uh, and sometimes they just omit that in a design phase. Thus, an attacker is able to impersonate a victim by spoofing source IP address and to send a request for data on behalf of the victim. Uh, an attacker will generate, say, 300 megabits of uh, requests, uh, but uh, the victim will receive like 30 gigabits of responses, uh, which will impose serious consequences for the li link congestion. There's a long list of protocols vulnerable to uh, amplification. Those are mostly uh, obsolete ones, uh, routing internet protocol version one, anyone? Uh, but there are modern protocols as well, such as gaming. Uh, as it's mostly obsolete servers, they eventually get updated or replaced or just trashed. Uh, thus, the amount of amplifiers shows steadily downtrend. Uh, however, once in a while, a new vulnerable protocol is discovered uh, and the number of amplifiers on the internet skyrockets at that moment. Uh, then it starts to decline again. The amplification factor is uh, basically how much data you can get in return towards a victim from an amplifying server compared to the size of a spoofed request. Our previous champion was uh, NTP, uh, with uh, uh, network time protocol, with amplification factor as high as 557. Other protocols carried much lower amplification factor values. So here is our today's hero, Memcached. Uh, Memcached is essentially a database. Uh, it's frequently used by web developers. Uh, it's an in-memory in k-value store uh, which can be used to put and then later retrieve values for different keys specified. So it's often used as a fast cache, hence the name. Uh, long time ago, memcached authors made a huge mistake. They made memcached listen on all interfaces, in, uh, including in ex externally facing ones by default. There are a lot of machines on the internet with port 11211 UDP open. And this port is Memcache ASCII protocol listener. This basic ASCII protocol, however, was meant to be used on loopback only or, or uh, in a local secure network at most. Hence, it doesn't do any authentication. This weakness is known for long. For years ago, Ivan Novikov from Walarm has discovered numerous methods to exploit memcached ASCII protocol and to inject an, an arbitrary data uh, in a memory of a memcached instance. Those are outlined in his talk on Black Hat United States. 
uh, in November 27, 17th, a new thread emerged. Uh, security researchers by name uh, Sheng Bao Kai, Chang Lu, and Li Fu have discovered a way for an attacker to use the ASCII protocol to send large portions of data from memcached memory towards a victim. Here is how it works. So this is basically uh, a short Python code snippet, which is all you should do to inject an, an arbitrary value into a memory of a remote vulnerable memcached server here by the name reflector.example.com. This value may be of an arbitrary size again. For the sake of DDoS simplification here, this snippet should be run only once. Uh, next, an attacker needs to send packets towards that vulnerable server with victim's IP source address and proper payload, uh, which Memcache uh, will treat as a cor uh, correct request. Here is how the payload is structured. Uh, this is, again, all an attacker needs to do to send a large portion of data, so the value of the key A, uh, they have put, be put, uh, put before. Uh, the value is, of course, reusable, and moreover, what's uh, even more convenient for web developers and completely disastrous for the internet, uh, the gets method in uh, Memcache accepts multiple arguments, so here's what you can do to send the uh, value five times in a row, multiplying the attack traffic five times, or ten times, or a hundred. Uh, so, uh, in theory, the amplification factor would be like millions, uh, yet, we are lucky, and in practice, all the packets of the response aren't sent, uh, aren't sent at once. Uh, in practice, we see an amplification factor close to uh, 9 or 10,000. This is still 20 times our previous champion, Network Time Protocol, amplification does. Our current mem memcache DDoS incidents range between some hundreds of gigabits per second, however, we can expect more, up to a figure of one and a half terabits per second, maybe. So how to mitigate that? Uh, once again, BCP38. Uh, we are all tired, I know, of repeating this, uh, but please, do not allow a spoofed traffic to pass through your network. Make sure you don't have a vulnerable memcached instance uh, at your disposal in your network. Use firewalls or BGP flow spec to filter port 11211 UDP across the border of your network, uh, as it's highly unlikely there's any legitimate traffic coming to uh, or from that port today through a border router. More news keep, keep coming by, uh, so please stay aware. The status will be updated as events warrant. Thanks. Right. Questions? Thank you very much. Any questions? We still have a bit of time before Chris. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ashley Jones with PCH. Have you guys seen any evidence of this being used in the wild? Of what? Of this? Yeah. We've experienced uh, like a handful of attacks already throughout the uh, last three days. And are booter services taking advantage of this? Uh, we actually f are filtering the traffic for our customers, so we are able to handle that. Oh, no, you're able to handle it, but booter service for pay uh, stress testers that um, would instead use Mariah, but now they might use this? Mm, I can't say for sure. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Al. So <laughs> next up we have Chris. I'm Chris Browning, uh, I'm from Lightwire, and I'm going to present on the uh, OpenLI project. Uh, Lightwire isn't actually doing the project itself, but uh, we're one of the sponsors uh, for it. So, brief history. Uh, Lawful Intercept in New Zealand, which is where I'm from, uh, the government has uh, gone and 
decided that the ETSI standard is the standard that they're going to use for lawful intercept. Uh, there is a way out by a mutual agreement, but uh, mostly it seems that uh, ETSI is the way they're pushing. Uh, and in New Zealand, uh, full lawful intercept um, compliance is required for 4,000 subscribers, which is not a lot of subscribers to support a full ETSI system. Uh, in New Zealand, there is absolutely no support or funds from the government in any way to subsidise or, or help deploying lawful intercepts, so it's completely on the service provider to figure out how they're going to fund it. Uh, some of the largest vendor um, ISPs in New Zealand have either bought a solution or they uh, have an inc incumbent uh, agreement. Uh, most of the other smaller ISPs to date kind of are doing what the uh, bird there is and they have to get their head in the sand and going, please don't look at me. Um, so some of the rest of us uh, want to sit in the middle. We go, we don't really want to do the vendor stuff because uh, it's very expensive, but at the same time, we don't want to stick our head in the sand. We've got to find some alternative. Uh, so what about Etsy is hard. So Etsy is a European standard, so it's used in Europe and a lot of other countries are adopting it as well. Um, thing about Etsy standards, uh, you know, you'd say there's a lawful intercept standard, but really there's about 20 standards and you have to piece it all together and figure out how it all works to actually do something. It's real time, so it's a real requirement on real time streaming to the agency, so there is only allowed to be a small amount of delay between the customer doing the traffic and the intercept agency receiving that traffic. So this doesn't allow for PCAP sending traffic, uh, PCAPs or email or anything like that like we used to do. Um, it also requires lossless de delivery of content, so you need to do uh, retransmission, sequence numbers, all that sort of stuff. You're not allowed to lose frames. There are court cases that have been thrown out because some packets in the middle are missing, so they just don't allow it. They also require a lot of metadata. It's not just good enough to have the stream of content, you need all the metadata that goes with it. This it depends on what you have, but things like link state, when the customer turns the router on or off, if they do DHCP, the DHCP information, uh, PPPoE, which is pretty predominant in New Zealand, they want to know all the information, uh, radius, and if you're doing voice, uh, SIP, RTP, all that sort of side as well. Uh, other things that are complicated, concurrent intercepts. So you might have multiple warrants running at the same time for multiple targets. Uh, you may have different types of warrants running for the same target. You may have an IP capture and a voice capture running on the same subscriber. Uh, you also may have multiple intercepts from different agencies. In New Zealand, there are five agencies that can do sh issue warrants to get intercept. They might uh, all issue things for the same subscriber at the same time, and you must deliver the content simultaneously to all of the agencies. Uh, likewise, uh, New Zealand has a very successful uh, fiber to the home program, and a, most of, well, a large number of New Zealand is connected at gig. Um, well, gig down 500 up. Um, so as you can imagine, if you've got a few people under, under warrant and then you've got a voice warrant, voice prioritization is really important to them. They, they really care about that phone call coming across pretty live. Uh, Etsy has its own format um, to do it in. It's not PCAP or anything that's well known. Um, and in New Zealand, the law is very, uh, very selective. If you send packets that are from another subscriber inside your lawful intercept, you are breaking the law. If you don't put packets in that went to the subscriber, you're also breaking the law. So you have to get it right. And this is obviously makes it quite hard. So what makes lawful intercept hard to swallow? So the lawful intercept standards are, in my opinion, written confusingly. Uh, Lawful intercept vendors love to make the lawful intercept area seem very mystical and hard to solve. You know, they make they like to portray it as hard, they and and hard. And the vendors really like to go. You have to do this. It's not optional. It's really hard to do. But hey, here's our solution. And if you work with us, it's really easy. Uh, interception is compulsory in a lot of countries, um, and vendors make use of this. They charge lots up front, and they also charge lots to support it. Um, in New Zealand dollars, you can be talking uh, five figures. Uh, so we're talking about a different approach. Uh, so this is where OpenLI comes in. Uh, I think the biggest difference, it's an open source project. Uh, the main developer is Shane Alcock. Uh, Shane uh, is probably familiar to some of you. He's presented at Apricot a number of times. 
Uh, he is a member of the WAND research group in the University of Waikato, New Zealand. Uh, the actual project itself is being managed by the University of Waikato WAND group, uh, which is very independent. They don't represent any service provider. Uh, reiterating, it's an open source project and it'll most likely be released under the GPL license. It's not quite confirmed yet. Um, there are six ISPs and enterprises currently supporting the project. I've only got a couple logos up there because they only have a couple companies' permission to put logos on the internet, um, but there are a few of us. A uh, bit about the WAND group. Uh, as I said, they're um, a research group within the University of Waikato. Their thing they do is they're very good at capturing and processing package, uh, packets. Um, they produced uh, LibTrace and LibProtoIdent, which is fairly well known. Um, and yeah, WAND has Shane Alcott, expert in packet capture, analyst and support. Um, he wrote that quote himself, but it stands. Um, and they're very experienced in using things like the Intel DPDK to make packet capture very fast. So what is OpenLA? It'll be based on LibTrace, uh, the pre-existing platform. It already supports Intel DPDK. Uh, it's going to work basically off um, span port information from your network. So you can, if the network can provide a span port, which is what a lot of ISPs do now to get PCAP data, and then you can plug this in. Obviously, you need a bunch of metadata, so it also knows how to take in radius, uh, SIP, RTP, and assemble a compliant stream. Uh, it deals with all of the complexities, buffering, and, and transmission to the, <coughs> to the agencies. Uh, work's already started. Work started in November 2017, uh, so the project is well underway. Um, and Lightwire and Inspire both um, aim to uh, put the system in production by June, uh, and under the law, we've already notified the, the government this is a system we're going to use. Uh, here's a brief overview of what, the, uh, what it looks like. Basically, you get lawful intercept requests come in, mostly in the form of a warrant. Uh, it goes through a provisioning system, which is generally a person in your NOC. Uh, they go and configure the BNGs for the packet filtering to get it to a spam port, whether it's a spam port or uh, some cases a VRF, whatever policy you need to apply to make the router spit that traffic out, nominally on a VLAN or something to identify it uniquely. Uh, and then you, this plugs in to collect that data at that point. So multiple BNGs, multiple collectors, it's fine, it deals with that. Uh, obviously with SIP, um, you've got SIP gateways around the place, um, you can do multiple collectors all running on x86 hardware. Uh, flows to a mediation box, which actually does all the buffering, ordering, sequencing, and sends it to the uh, agency. So really fairly straightforward in terms of it's designed to drop into an existing network. It doesn't require inherent vendor support. It just needs you to know what you already used to know when you had to dr drive PCAPs or what it was before. Uh, most people can take a span point of, or a report of customer data. So. Where does it leave us? So the project has enough funding now to do the basics. So there's a couple of ISPs that are probably producing most of the funding, and we're building this predominantly to work in our networks. Um, this is a good starting place. Um, we'll support uh, data, uh, SIP, et cetera, the things we run, but we don't support like the mobile standards, um, you know, the 3G standards and whatnot. Um, so the project is looking for additional partners to, to uh, potentially put money forward for additional features, uh, obviously maintain the project. And to be honest, it's going to be an open source project, um, but we don't have the funds to promote it, get it out there, and actually get other people interested in using it. Uh, so that ends. Um, I you know, shamelessly plug for people who might want to sponsor us. Um, feel free to uh, contact anyone that I have up there, um, either myself, uh, the one guys, or Dave from Inspire, who is also driving it with me. Thank you. Is there any questions? That's perfect timing. Was Thanks it? very much. Absolutely. Perfect. Well done. Thank you. So next up we have Aftab. Aftab is starting his run from the back of the room. This speaker is out. Can we take that? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Tab to F tab, we have RAM. So RAM, get yourself ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Aftab Siddiqui, Technical Engagement Manager, uh, ISOC. So um, 
I'm going to present the IXP mapping project. Um, it's a four or five slide. I'll, I won't take much time, but I'm really looking forward for the feedback and your help and support uh, to make it further better. Uh, yes, it's just another mapping project. There are too many available right now. Some of them are out to date. Some of them are um, updated as well. But uh, yeah, so it's slightly different. You'll see uh, two markers. One is blue, one is red. Blue will identify all the IXPs, existing IXPs uh, in the Asia Pacific region. We were only targeting the I, uh, Asia Pacific region. Uh, I'll explain why we did it um, in a later slide. So the blue markers identify the existing ones. So it will tell you the details like where they are, uh, how many members, and uh, whether we consider it as a commercial entity or a neutral uh, or open entity. Um, but then it's, we have taken this data from the publicly available uh, databases or websites. If you think this is not correct, please let us know and we'll fix it. It's not like a statement that this is how it is. And uh, okay, so it has two uh, aspects. One is the map, which uh, gives you all the markers. So this is, this is a map which gives you all the marker and then when we have a heat map. So um, why we did it? Um, we got a, a request from the United Nations ASCAP project is the, um, which targets the Asia Pacific region. And uh, they wanted to know that uh, where are the IXPs in the Asia Pacific and where uh, we need more IXPs. We tried a lot of, uh, um, uh, we, 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 we were working on the information available uh, publicly, and we couldn't find any way to figure out where should we have an IXP. Well, we know a couple of uh, cities and countries where we should have an IXP, but we couldn't find a matrix to uh, get to this point. So we said, okay, fine, let's try a population counter. So figure out where's, where's, what are the most populous city in a country, and uh, create a benchmark that, okay, fine, let's take an example of, uh, I'll give you an example of India. So if the city has more than uh, one million population, something really went wrong. I don't know. I was not yelling. So uh, if you have a, if, if, if the city has more than one million population, uh, we said, okay, fine, probably it's a good idea to have an IX over there. But the problem, second problem was uh, the census data was too old. So the census data available uh, for India via United Nations website was from 2001, and this is 2018. We did this project in late 2017, so we, we are not sure uh, if this is the right uh, benchmark. So we are open to that. We did this just to show uh, some numbers, some matrix uh, to the U UN ASCAP, and uh, it, it helped them understand, well, yes, we need a lot of uh, investment in IX in a lot of places. So uh, this is just a disclaimer to just make sure that we have taken data from all these places. Um, thanks to PCH, uh, um, Internet Exchange uh, Map, um, and uh, well, Internet Society has a, a stale website called IXP Toolset, which we haven't updated for quite a couple of years. So yeah, uh, we have taken data from all these places, um, and we have uh, covered it on their website. If you think we haven't covered it on our website in the right manner, please let us know. Uh, we need more data. We need more data points. And if you are working with uh, an IXP and you think it's not there and it's, it's neutral, it's not commercial, and it's commercial, it's not neutral, and you are increasing number of uh, uh, members and it's not visible. So one problem we saw, like we found out, like PCH has been uh, doing a wonderful job for the last 20 years telling you how to make your IXP website. Uh, and we found out only a couple of them are following it. So um, it's a good idea to follow them. Otherwise, it's very difficult to uh, get the right uh, data from your website. Uh, make sure that members are listed properly. Uh, don't use Flash. Um, and then show your graphs, show your traffic. I mean, if you're doing a good thing, why not show the traffic? So we struggled a lot in some places, uh, but some websites were very, very simple. It's easy to get. The next step uh, is uh, to automate this, um, to get all the information as quickly as possible. Thanks to Megaport, um, their 
uh, their data is available uh, through APIs. It's easier to fetch everything. Uh, we couldn't find anything from anywhere else. Um, yeah, I know it's um, small IXPs are struggling. They don't know how to do things. We are happy to help in the best possible manner. And I'm pretty sure Megaport will help you as well. So, yep, that's it. Small thing. Take a look. Uh, if you think something can be updated, something can be improved, let us know. We are happy to help. It was a, a small project just to give some numbers to the United Nations. It worked, but we want to carry it forward and make it uh, the best solution, sorry, best portal for the IXP information in the region. That's our motive. Uh, help us so that we can make it further. Thank you. Any questions? Hello. Yeah, my name is Amrish from Afrinik. Uh, I find this very interesting because we uh, had similar ideas uh, for Africa. So I would like to know how I can perhaps collaborate with you on this to uh, to, to extend this to to Africa, uh, perhaps with the Internet Society. Yep. Uh, I'm 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 happy to. Um, so what we have done is we have created. Uh, sub-regions within the Asia-Pacific, so South Asia, Southeast Asia, and two more, East mm -hmm. Asia and Pacific. And uh, we, we have created um, logins for our uh, ambassadors in those sub-regions. Okay. I'm happy to create a login for you if you are willing to update all this thing. Um, I mean, it's a community thing. I can't do it myself. It sure. was one-time effort for myself. I want people like you to help me out. Great. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm open to this one. Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, after it's Nishal, uh, general internet person. Uh, you can't firstly, be. Firstly, thanks for the shout out uh, for using the PCH data. Um, it's great what you've done. Uh, I have nothing to say, well done. Uh, I was just going to point out that, uh, and actually I came up because Amrish asked, how can you get the data for Africa? Um, we have a map that actually will, will do that for you. It will show you on a per region basis. So if you want to see the stuff for Africa, or uh, the LAC region or North America, um, one of the sources that he cited, you can actually do that right now. Uh, the other way you can do it is you can also reach out to AFIX, the African Exchange Point Association, similar to APEX here, and we'll be happy to give you the data. But again, it's all graphed from the same location. Uh, again, great job, and if there's anything that we at PCH can do to help you, or well, anyone else out here, please feel free to reach out to myself or any of our, my colleagues that are here as well. Can I quickly Thanks. respond, Philip? Yeah. So yeah, just just to add, like uh, as uh, Nishal said, uh, there is a project called uh, ARDA, if I'm not mistaken. Arda. Yeah. Arda. Arda so uh, uh, I'm not yelling, guys. Sorry. So um, so I thought colleagues are involved that that one. So uh, I would love to see a, a collaboration in both. Um, I mean, Africa is F F F I X is just uh, very much. It's, it's very hard to get information from the African IXs. So, but, uh, but whatever is available on ARDA, it is useful. I would love to take as much possible from there and put it in this one. I, I don't want to do it for Africa. I want, if somebody from the community would like to take it. Uh, my, my plan was to present it in AIS as well. We are doing it here, so why not? So, thank you. I'm Masataka from JPIX. Uh, let me ask a short question. Uh, there is no pmdb.com for data source. Why not? Sorry? Uh, there is no pmdb.com for data source uh, website. Because I haven't taken anything from there. PMDB. 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 For the data source. Yes. That's uh, what I'm saying. Uh, I have not taken any information from there. That's why I haven't mentioned them here. Why? why? Okay, you are asking why you haven't taken. Okay, that's Ten seconds. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'll get a, get get in touch with you in detail and anyone who is willing to. Uh, I found uh, reconciling the data from Pering DB. I found a lot of stale information, okay, which was not done. true. You're done. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Saved thank by you. the clock. Okay, Ram, you're on. And Jordi, you're next. Ram? No, no. You're next after Ram. Okay. Namaste and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Ram Krishna Pariyar. Uh, professionally, I'm working as a Subishu, as a senior network engineer. I'm represent uh, NPNOC as a uh, uh, 
committee members as well as the voluntary working as a NPIX. It is our great pleasure to welcome all of you here and conduct APRICO 2018 in Kathmandu, Nepal. Okay? Okay, uh, this is the network topology which we are currently using here. Okay, uh, we have a two core routers and uh, the two code switches and in multiples like distribution switch and access switches here. Okay, and for the office team providers, we have a two different office team providers. The office team providers provide two redundant link from two different pop locations, okay? And uh, one of the office team provider is Subisu, and another is a Whirling, okay? Subisu, yes, in the, uh, there are two routers here, uh, GW-code as 01 and GW-code as 02, okay? Each provider is terminated, the primary, primary link and the secondary link in the two different routers, okay? And we run a EBGP with the, uh, uh, obviously with the uh, office team providers, okay? And, uh, and for the, uh, for the uh, uh, wireless client and the wire client, we just use for the BRRP for the gateway, okay? And the first IP will be the in router one, and the second IP will be the router two, and the third IP, uh, sorry, uh, the first IP will be the gateway, and the second and third will be the different routers, okay? This is the typical network diagram which we are currently running here. Yeah, I have already mentioned that uh, we have a two office team providers. One is a Subishu and another is a Whirling. Subishu and Whirling both provide 2 into 10G uh, internet for this workshop, Apricot 2018, okay? Uh, in addition to, Subisu also provide a one additional one, uh, one gig interface for NPI's connectivity. We have around uh, 10 members already pairing with the NPX uh, from this uh, uh, conference network, okay? And for, for the uh, route, we, we get a full BGP feed for IPv4 as well as IPv6 from both office team provider. Okay, these are our uh, address allocations. Okay, uh, basically the AS numbers which are using, this one is like APNIC AS numbers, 24555. The IPv4 address, definitely we are using 220.247.144.0 slash 20. Likewise, we also use IPv6, 2001 colon DF9 colon colon uh, is a 32. Okay. It should be 32. And we created three different VLAN, 101, 102, and 103. 101 for the wireless, all the wireless client, 102 for the wire client, and the 103 for the management and infrastructure networks, okay? Likewise, we also divide in the B6 address, planning accordingly, okay? The equipment which we are using to set up these small ISPs, like, Use core routers, as a two core routers, use MX104. We also use two core switches, but the one is a Juniper, EX3300, and Xtreme X670. So likewise, we also use distribution switch for different, uh, different uh, uh, locations, like Xtreme X460 and the Juniper EX3300. And all these access switch, we are using the Xtreme X2580E-48P with PoE, okay? For the wireless AP, we are using the Cambium, okay? We are using the four different series of the Cambium, like E600, E501S, uh, E500, and the E410. The timeline, yeah, definitely this is one of the major part, okay? We collect all the uh, resources uh, uh, before 15 February, 
uh, before that, our technical group, all the technical group, we, uh, uh, we uh, schedule a meeting regularly and update the prefix and update the tax tax. Okay, and from 15 February, we move in. Uh, we move all these devices here, establish the uh, knock room and rag and etc. Okay, from 16 to 18 February, uh, we pull all the Ethernet cables. We install uh, AP and network optimizations. Okay. From 19 to 24, uh, workshop week support and preparation for conference week. Okay. And from 25 to 28, the uh, conference, uh, conference is going on. Okay. And might be we are planning to turn down all the devices March 2nd. Uh, this is our uh, knock, knock rooms where we set up all these uh, two routers, uh, multiple switches, servers, and uh, multiples, primary DNA, secondary DNA, and all of these parts, okay? These are some statics. Basically, we don't, we don't feel any uh, high CPU and memory utilizations uh, this time, okay? And this is some wireless clients statics, okay? Uh, we notice the maximum wireless clients is connected 1,077 with 2.4 gigahertz frequency and the 5 gigahertz different band. Okay. The total AP we are using 65 and the sum of the APs are not used. Okay. This is the uh, some dashboards from the uh, uh, wireless controller. We are using the Cambium uh, wireless controller. Okay. And the traffic utilization is not so much high. It's, approx it's like 152 Mbps, even though both Office team provider provide, give 20 Gbps, 20 Gbps, all together it's 40 Gbps. Okay. Okay. These are the, our technical team who build the network and make success at the uh, event. These are the some name of the technical team, uh, myself, and uh, team leaders, Kavindra Sister, okay? And the team members, yeah, Maz, yeah, Tasi, he also helped us a lot, okay? Ravindra Moharjan, Uttam Sister Rana, Kijus Moharjan, Rustam Sister, Chatur, Sakya, Aman Sister, Rupesh Basnet, uh, Rupesh Kumar Thapa, Niranjan Prajuli, Niraj Acharya, Divya Khatiwada, and all these setups, we, we get a guidance from the, uh, our seniors, Gaurav Rajupadhyay, sir, as well as from Rupesh Rester and Samit, sir, as well as Intrar, NPNOC, as well as NPIX team. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. We have a minute for questions, just in case there are any. No, I would like to thank the technical team for all the work they've done. So, Anurag, I'll give you a quick half a minute. Hi. Uh, Ram, please come back. Sure. Keep talking, Anurag. Did you collect any statistics about uh, how many out of 1,000 plus wireless clients, how many of them connected on 2.4 only versus 5? Yeah, we have also collected that information. That is also mentioned in the, uh, I think, in the slide also. Okay. okay. You can go in the slide. No. You don't have time. Okay. okay. Basically, the majority of these 2.4 gigahertz is very less, and uh, more than 70% uh, is a 5 gigahertz. Oh. Slides are on the back, by the way, if you want to refer to anything. I know we're going through everything quickly, so if you're in doubt, have a look on the website and. Um, talk to the presenter directly. Jordi. Hello again. If you expect to hear a new talk about IPv6, you are in the wrong meeting room. Uh, for once, I am not going to talk about IPv6. Uh, I don't know. Um, OK, this is a very quick introduction to, to three new topics. Well, one of them is not so new, which is uh, HTTP2. Um, basically, the idea of the presentation is to, to explain that uh, we all know internet is changing. Uh, for many reasons, we are using more and more just HTTP and HTTPS. 
uh, and it looks like only DNS is not yet using those protocols, but that's changing as well. Um, there are clear advantages of, of uh, using uh, very few protocols. Uh, it means you can correct mistakes changing less things. Uh, there are also some disadvantages, but the reality is that most, uh, more and more uh, different kind of networks, operators, uh, hotspots, and so on, they, they, they filter everything except uh, those protocols, right? So, so it's, it's a path that, that we cannot avoid. Um, okay, quick uh, story uh, from uh, HTTP to Speedy. Uh, HTTP was uh, originally defined in 91 and then revised it in 99 uh, as HTTP uh, 1.1. Um, since then, we had got a big evolution from a few objects and a few kilobytes to, to, to many objects and, and megabytes of, of uh, data in a single uh, web page. And uh, HTTP.1.1 uh, uh, is not really performing uh, very well in, in that situation. So in 2009, Google started a project or published a project uh, information about the Speedy, um, which basically is trying to multiplex uh, concurrent requests uh, uh, across a single TCP connection, uh, compress and reduce uh, HTTP uh, headers uh, prior prioritize uh, some access, some as some assets, um, and also allow a server push. Um, a speedy basically is a tunnel for HTTP in HTTPS. Um, it requires support in both sides, uh, of course, servers, uh, server and browser, and the support in 2016 was already 90% worldwide. Um, Speedy uses what they call NPN, which is next uh, protocol negotiation um, uh, with the TLS servers. So then we had the situation in 2012 where a new working group was created in, uh, in ITF, which is HTTP uh, BIS, um, and used Speedy as a starting point for developing HTTP version 2. Um, the protocol was approved in 2015, and the main difference is that it does, it, it does not require HTTPS. However, the browser vendors only implemented, uh, I think, almost all of them, uh, support for HTTP2 with TLS, so it's HTTPS. Uh, of course, that's not in general a big issue because we have, for example, Let's Encrypt, which allow free, automated, and open uh, uh, certificates for, for making sure that you can have your website or your web servers with support for TLS. Um, with TLS, instead of using NPN, is using ALPN, which stands for Application Layer Protocol Negotiation. Um, earlier implementation supported NPN because the previous support of Speedy. Um, and the main difference is that in the case of NPN, the client makes the choice, while in ALPN, the client gives the server a list of protocols and the server picks, picks, up, uh, picks up one. Um, there is already 25% of the websites today uh, supporting this, so it's a, a good, uh, good coverage. Uh, this is a basic description of uh, how HTTP 1.1 works. Uh, and the multiplexing done in HTTP those. I, I, I steal the pictures from, from different websites, so I put the references of all those websites which could provide additional information if, if you are interested in checking that. Um, very, very short description of HTTP 2. It's a binary protocol, it's multiplexing streams, it has priorities and dependencies, it allows the header compression, it allows doing a reset, uh, the server push, and the flow control. That's the, the, the very basic description of all the things that change compared with HTTP 1.1. Uh, and this is a summary overview of, of, the, of the, the protocol. Uh, HTTP 2 supports also extensions. A client and server can negotiate uh, new frame times on, on a hop-by-hop -hop basis. 
Uh, for example, there is alternative services and there is opportunistic TLS, some, some of the uh, things that uh, are being used right now. Um, I have worked already uh, since probably four or five years in implementing HTTP uh, to in my production server. So I am using actually Apache. So I did basically what, what you have in the, in, the, in the screen. I am not going through that. Uh, it's possible also to use uh, in NGN IX. I am using Apache, um, Apache 2. Um, and there is also several websites which provide you a very quick uh, demo of uh, how much faster it can uh, be a website, depending, of course, of, of the information and the number of objects and so on. Typically, it's 2.5 times faster, okay? So I cannot run here the, the live demo. We don't have time, but you can try it yourself. There are also some extensions for very common browsers like Chrome and Firefox. In the case of Chrome, I think it's called uh, HTTP2 and a speed indicator, and it's, it's like a lightning that changes the color, and also if you put the cursor over there, you can see what protocol is running that web page, and ag again, the same for Firefox. I, I have not been able to, to see if there are similar extensions for Internet Explorer or, for example, uh, Opera or any other, so, so uh, I am, or even Safari, I don't think there is an extension for Safari. I am using basically Chrome, so, so that's, that's what I know. Uh, the second protocol I want to introduce very quickly is called Quick. Um, basically, during the development of SPD, it was obvious that TCP is inefficient for uh, most of the actual internet usages, so they started to work out on what they call quick UDP internet connections. Uh, there is now uh, a specific working group for quick at ITF, and basically is developing this UDP-based stream protocol encrypted uh, transport. Uh, the initial case is HTTP over UDP, but it's expected also that will be uh, somehow HTTP2 uh, facilities uh, supported, right? Uh, it was, it's already deployed by Google, so around 9%, which is not peanuts, of the internet traffic is already using it. If you have this speed indicator that I mentioned before in some of the browsers and you connect to Google, uh, you, will, you will see that you are using most of the time a quick instead of uh, HTTP2. Uh, the standard requires, well, the standard, what, what is being uh, standardized at the moment, it can change because it's work in progress. Uh, it requires encryption, uh, is using TLS 1.3. Um, this allow basic RTT measurements packet loss. There is a proposal, um, that's, that's a bad thing because you cannot do measurements. So there is a proposal for what they call a spin bit to be able to do those measurements, okay? So that's one of the drawbacks, but probably it's going to be sorted out. This is a quick comparison between TCP, TCP with TLS, and QUIC. Uh, and the last protocol, just one slide, a single slide, because again, it's work in progress and it's not so much advanced as the case for QUIC. Uh, the ITF DNS over HTTPS DOH uh, working group is standardizing the encoding of DNS queries and responses over HTTPS. This will solve certain problems of existing DNS methods, and for example, it will avoid authorities impose traffic discriminations or censorship. So just stay tuned and follow the development, and maybe in a new event, I can talk about those protocols already being standardized. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Jordi. No time for questions, bang on okay. time again. Thank you. Next up is Tom. And Win Ning, if you get yourself ready, because you're next. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Tom, I'm from Cloudflare, and I've got a public service announcement, and that is, we are all doomed. Um, DDoS attacks are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, 2011, we saw 80 gigabits, 2013, we saw 300 plus, 2014, 500, 2016, 600. Um, as our friendly f folks just before just said, we're to expect one and a half terabit attacks um, now. Um, how much of this can the internet actually carry? 500 gigs. That's the answer. Um, if you're pushing traffic to somewhere else on the internet, 
Um, there is very, very, very rarely more than 500 gigabits of capacity uh, across network boundaries to be able to carry it any further. Um, so if you have a single point and it is getting targeted and you don't have 500 gigabits of capacity, you will fail. Um, so the internet can't carry more than about 500. It's many single paths on the internet don't have more than 40 or 50 gigabits of, of open capacity. So you'll find between um, providers in a single location, 40 to 50 gig is the max that they'll carry. Um, centralized services will fail. Um, if you're hosting a web server yourself or if you're a small provider, your network will fail with attacks like this and there will be a lot of collateral damage, damage around you as well. Um, so what's next? Only a few networks can truly handle attacks of this scale. Um, there, there's probably five or six networks in the world that can actually cope with this. Um, doing DDoS protection in line doesn't scale. Um, you cannot buy enough boxes um, to put in your network to be able to filter the traffic because your network will be congested before it can get to those boxes. Um, and no network has enough capacity to bring it into a single location anyway. Um, so core interconnection of the internet's at risk. These attacks are of such a scale that inter-network connections can be broken. Um, and no backbone will be able to carry this amount of traffic. So big, big thing is the decentralized internet is at risk. Um, we're all doomed. Um, Self-hosted self uh, self applications cannot be secured, so you must use a cloud provider. Um, the only networks that can actually scale, and there's, like I said, there's only about five of them that can. Um, but cloud providers don't give you internet access. You can't connect a DSL circuit into your cloud provider. So what can we do if your DSL circuit gets attacked? You go down, damage is just the same. Um, what can we do? Fix spoofing. This is part of the biggest, this is the biggest part of the problem. Um, DDoS attacks that, that can be attributed can be stopped. Um, no attribution means no retribution. No attribution means no discussion. We can't actually do anything about fixing it unless we can know who's doing it. BCP38, I know it's, it's, it's uh, beating a dead horse, but we've <laughs> got to do this. We have to do this. We have to start filtering. Um, even if you don't want to do URPF because you complain it changes your forming performance, you can put a very, very simple ACL at the edge of your network, which does a pretty good job. Just do it. Thank you. Lots of time for questions. <laughs> yeah, microphone, please. Uh, hi again, Toma Gorichenko, Curator Labs. I want to ask a quick question. So you are telling basically that self-hosted applications can be secured, but there are managed uh, service providers like cloud which can be used to like uh, analyze and filter traffic going t towards those self-hosted. So self-hosted. Yes. Yeah. So so I, I guess I, I mean more you're putting it on directly. Um, if you've got a barrier in front of it through a cloud provider which is proxying it and you're able to obfuscate the host, um, you can most likely secure it. Oh, okay, thanks. Any others? Thank you. No? All right, thanks very much, Tom. Um, finally, we have um, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wen Nai from Equinix. Uh, today, I would like to share about the BGP large communities to be used in the internet exchange point. And uh, we, we shall take a look with the uh, very similar scenarios. Uh, there are four peers and routes are connected to uh, internet exchange switch fabric and uh, the public uh, peer in VLAN. And they have the, all the peers are, uh, have the PGP as established to route server as a multilateral peering. And peer A has a selected peering policy he wants to announce a prefix to only peer B and C, not to D. So typically it can be done by the BGP communities, three communities. Uh, the first one, do not announce to anybody. And third, second and third, uh, I wish to announce to ES2 and 3. So when the route server uh, receive this prefix, it will be processed according to the input routing policy and it will be 
the fix will be re announced back only to peer B and C. So, and what if peer C uh, is number is four pi ESN? We cannot fit <coughs> two four one five colon one two three four five six into the normal BGP community attribute, which is only thirty two bits long. So. Uh, how can we overcome this situation? We have BGP large communities, which is defined in RFC 8092 uh, in early February uh, 2017. The, this large community has a 12 bytes long, uh, composed of three fields. Uh, the first field is a global admin, uh, according to uh, RFC recommendation. It should be the ASN who announced the prefix. And second, local data part one has to be action. What uh, I would like to do, uh, for example, do not announce, announce, uh, prepend once, twice. And local data part two is a uh, ASN, again, where the destination is that the action has to be applied to. So uh, we, we shall use this BGP large communities in a previous scenario. Uh, so BRA ES1 will be tagged with uh, one colon, two, four, one, one, five, colon, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, which means one as a global admin, that is me, two, four, one, one, five, which is the action announced. And one, two, three, four, five, six uh, is a destination AS, uh, which means that uh, I am AS1 would like to announce to one, two, three, four, five, six for this prefix. So when the route server receives uh, this uh, prefix announcement, uh, they will be processed according to the input policy, and now uh, the prefix has been successfully announced back to PSC. Uh, this large communities can be applied, applicable to other actions such as uh, ES prepend uh, and so on and so forth. So the operational concentration, uh, if PR routers, which doesn't support, and he like to take action, something to four by ASN, we can use the BGP extended communities, which is used, mostly used in service provider platforms. And we just swap uh, the first field with the RT as a route target. That, that's the way we can do that. And the peer router receives the BGP large communities. Uh, he doesn't know. And that should be OK. That should not be the problem as a BGP uh, Community attribute is uh, uh, optional at transitive, so it should not uh, tear down the BGP sessions or uh, uh, crush the BGP process. So another thing is uh, route, uh, it, it, it appear they announce the prefix with the uh, multiple communities with conflicting actions, uh, such as large communities want to prevent once, and extended community want to prevent twice. So the route server should have the clear, uh, clear routing policy. He must define cl very clearly how to handle such a situation. So that's the, that's the thing i like to share for today. And this VGP large communities has been supported in all uh, route server in Equinix Internet Exchange, so please feel free to use that. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> one question. I'm Astaka from JPIX. Uh, one question. Uh, have you supported uh, BGP large communities in your exchange already? Yes. Uh, There are already customers using uh, BGP large community now. 
so far, we don't see it's being announced yet okay. in, in, in our six metros. So there are tons of prefixes. So, so far, we take a look. We don't see the availability. Okay, thank you very much. Well, okay. Any other questions? If not, no, thank you very much. So that was absolutely perfect timing. We managed to fit 10 presentations into the 90 minutes we had. Thank you for presenters for starting on time and being a all the questions. Um, we now have a 30 minutes break. Uh, the, the closing plenary will start at 4.30. Can I ask you all to please leave the room because we need to turn everything around to face that direction. Um, for the closing plenary, and we need to move the petitions as well. So we'll give Patel enough space to do that. Everything else, I would really appreciate it. Otherwise, thank you all very much, and see you in 30 minutes. <laughs>